Hello and welcome to Sacred Psychology, the podcast for misfits and mystics. Here, neuroscience and spirituality go hand in hand. Join me, Tamara Powell, on a no holds barred adventure outside the box, because that's where all the truly great shit happens anyway. Welcome back to Sacred Psychology. I'm your host, Tamara Powell, and today's episode is all about shadow work and astrology. Truth be told, this is probably one of my absolute most favorite conversations to date, hands down. Not only do I get to interview an incredible woman who is also a great colleague, mentor, and friend, but I am diving into some of my absolute favorite topics and ones that you all end up talking to me about online time and time again. So my guest today is Dr. Lourdes Viado. Lourdes is a depth psychologist, providing psychotherapy for women in her private practice in Las Vegas, Nevada, as well as mentorship and consulting services to clients worldwide. As a passionate explorer of inner worlds, Lourdes loves accompanying her clients into the depths of their psyches, helping them unearth the roots of their suffering and discover the buried treasure hidden there. Dr. Viado utilizes a Jungian depth psychology approach, integrating mindfulness, dream work, shadow work, metaphor, storytelling, poetry, and astrology into her work with clients. She is also the host of the Women in Depth podcast, which is a podcast about the inner lives of women, what is feared, hidden, unknown, and uncomfortable. Y'all, if you have not heard this podcast, you are missing out. It has been downloaded over 90,000 times in 114 countries and has also been included in the top 50 therapy podcasts of 2017 by Player.fm. So you are in for a treat. Buckle up, buttercup. It's about to go down. Hey, Lourdes. Hi, Tamara. Welcome to the show, girlfriend. Well, I'm excited to be here. It's been quite a process. <laughs> <laughs> it has. That just means it's going to be amazing. Yeah. But yet, if our listeners don't know, I've already been on yours like three times. So this feels like home. <laughs> and they're going to quickly very much see why I'm just so adoring of you. Uh, thank you, Tamara. Yes. Yeah, so today, I want to dive into you what I see is literally like one of your top expertise, the shadow. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) And I'm so excited about this because I'm definitely going to sound snarky right here. I see that term thrown around so flippantly and I don't think people understand what it means. Yeah. It's, it's kind of gotten a a little bit more popular. It's a buzzword. Uh, It's hipster. (laughs) Cool. Now Carl Jung would be so thrilled. Oh, Carl! (laughs) I feel like people are trying to put those jingle balls in Carl Jung's beard. Like, no, (laughs) don't, don't French this up. (laughs) So you were actually trained in Jungian psychology, correct? Yes, I did my, um, my doctoral program um, on Jungian studies. So for you, this is legit deep work. It is depth work. It is the most important work we do. I, I, I'm biased towards that. <laughs> Be biased. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that it's um, the most important work we can do for ourselves, uh, for those we are in relationship with, and for the world. I think if everybody would do their shadow work, um, we would ha- have a, a much more peaceful and conscious existence. Ooh. <laughs> I'm just, I'm already swooning. I'm like, oh my God. Ooh, I know, it doesn't take much for me. I'm like, I'm a cheap date. <laughs> Hilarious. Oh my God. So, uh, girl, break down the shadow for somebody who's never heard of it or who may have just read an article on the internet. So basically, the shadow is everything that we fear, deny, don't allow ourselves to do. And it's also the parts of ourself that are unaddressed, left behind, or, or excluded. So a lot of times when we think shadow, people immediately think of um, negative. You know, right. that it's, it's everything we do not wish to be. And that's true. You know, mm-hmm. that, that there's truth to that, to that. But it's also everything that we are not in touch with. These can be unrealized potentials. These can be um, our own strengths, but we Ooh. don't realize the shadow in our strengths. 
So, um, for an example of that could be someone who maybe is um, very giving with their time and service oriented and is always volunteering and doing things for others. Um, and the shadow in that, which this person could probably pass a lie detector test and say, no, that's not it at all, is there's a, there's a control behind that. Oh, yes. Yes, 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 <laughs> yes, yes. I'm so glad that that's the example you started to kick things <laughs> off with. Because seriously, how many women and men alike really pride themselves on being givers and nurturers? Like, you know, I'm an Enneagram that the type two on the Enneagram is the nurturer and it's authentic to them and we don't want to change that in them. But there is that shadow side, as you're talking about, where the Enneagram points out to their deadly sin is pride or control. We manipulate yeah. if we're not careful to get that need fed. I need you to see me as a nurturer. Let me love you. <laughs> well, it also shows up, you know, we, we hear a lot. This is a buzzword now too, is codependency. Oh, yes. And where there's one person, you know, who's the codependent, who is doing everything and putting the other person, person first, but with the codependent, and I'm just using that I don't want to label a person, but just for the yes. purposes of our conversation, mm -hmm. um, the codependent actually is just as manipulative and in and wanting to control the other part, their, their partner, they're just going about it in a different way. You're right. It's a seesaw effect back and forth. We have yeah. to have both sides. So then we start to run into, if I'm understanding you correctly, the untapped potential is if I don't have boundaries or I'm giving out of my sacrifice rather than my abundance, I'm going to end up into problems. And if I'm not aware of them, then I don't tap into some great potentials. Yeah, absolutely. I think with shadow, what's difficult about it is it, it's really kind of looking at yourself in a really, really, well, we'll say bad, but it's a really good mirror. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and looking at yourself up close with all the lights on and there's no makeup and you see the lines and you see the wrinkles and you see my Every straight day. hairs. Yeah, all of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and we, you know, it, it's hard. It's hard to look at ourselves like that. Yeah, but I love the picture that you're painting with it because so many times, and this frustrates the shit out of me when I watch it happen with people who don't really understand what they're doing, they talk about how scary it is and, oh, I'm going to dive into shadow work and I got to really prep myself for it. And I, I think it gets an overly too much so negative thing because the way you're talking about it, it can be challenging yeah. to see yourself, but why does it have to, it almost has this like destructive sound to it. Right, right. I think the, the, the word that I would use for shadow work is it's uncomfortable. That's, yeah. That's really the best word to capture it. It's uncomfortable because um, shadow work is turning the spotlight on yourself. And not yeah. in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it's a great way, but not in a, yay, look at me side. Right. You know, all the people who have, you know, made your life difficult, who have hurt you, wronged you, all this, we shift away from that. We just look at yourself. And that's hard for all of us. You know, it's not, it's a lot easier to focus on the person who screwed us over. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yes. And so how many people come into therapy, especially like I see this very prominently in couples counseling. We want someone to blame for things. Mm -hmm. And yet that's such a disempowering approach. What I love about shadow work is it, it gives us back our power if we're willing to build a little distress tolerance and say, yes. what was my part in this? Because if I did have a part in it, then I can change it. I can't necessarily change my partner. Yes, that's so true. Because often people show up in couples therapy where they really are just both trying to get the therapist to see their side and help them to vilify their partner every freaking time and as someone who's gone through <laughs> couples counseling I want to be like I didn't do that but no seriously take a look in the mirror of course they wanted the therapist to think I was the smart grounded one come on <laughs> <laughs> I would never contribute to any relationship difficulties yeah and I, I think too with with shadow work another word that, I, that comes to mind along with uncomfortable it's just blind spots it's aspects of ourselves that not only are they difficult to see, but sometimes we just can't see them. It's, it's like, you know, when you're driving, you always have a blind spot, spot when you're driving, which is why before you change lanes, you should look, you know? Yes. Um, but we always have blind spots. And so that's also why shadow work, we learn about our shadow from others because mm -hmm. typically it's those closest to us. And this is usually our children and our significant others 
who can point out our shadow, which is also why it bothers us so much. Every damn time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my sweet Jesus. Yes, I call that my heavenly sandpaper. <laughs> because if you will allow that distress tolerance, right, that rubbing to, mm -hmm. to be there, then you can end up creating something really, really beautiful. But it's not always fun. And the thing too, like I think it's important for people to know is we all develop shadow just because we all grow up in families, societies, and traditions uh, where there are things that are okay and things that are not okay. And so the way that shadow forms is as a child, you learn really quickly, oh, it's not okay to, um, to argue or to voice my opinion. And when I do that, um, I notice my parents treat me differently. And so what can happen is that child puts that outspokenness, that courage into, I call it like a bag and puts it away mm. and they, they, and it just gets tucked away and they move through life no longer connected to that part of themselves because when they shared that part of themselves, um, they realize that if I do this, love is withheld, I lose approval. Um, and so that's, that's how shadow is formed. Mm. Is, and then what happens is like, for example, let's use sexuality. If you grow up in a, environment where um, sexuality was seen as solely for procreation. Mm -hmm. So you learn really quickly to put that part of you, yourself into, into your own conscious or to put it into this metaphoric bag. And so when you get older, you may find yourself being very judgmental of what you perceive as sex, overly sexualized people or behaviors, mm -hmm. um, or you may play the part, go to church, save yourself till you're married before you have any intercourse, but you are online surfing porn sites. Yeah. So, so it's in shadow and there's a, there's a element of shame connected to it. And that's also one of the things that can help you, you know, determine if there's some shadow stuff here is usually there's um, shame and mm -hmm. I'll say inappropriate guilt. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Tap into that a little bit further as to the difference between healthy guilt and inappropriate guilt. Well, inappropriate guilt happens when you haven't done anything to harm anyone. You haven't done anything wrong, but yet you feel like you did. Like if you ask this person, but what did you do? I didn't do anything, but I just feel bad, yes. you know, or the shame comes because what you did bad is you disappointed someone, your, your, your God, your parents, your, your significant other. You know, and so it's not appropriate because you, you really, if you, if you look at it, you didn't do anything that was hurtful. You didn't um, do anything wrong in the sense of this is not a bad, evil thing that you did. Maybe what you did was, you know, this happens to some children. They were caught masturbating. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now there's a sense of shame around that and that your, your mom walked in on you and you're going to go to hell. And, and so you feel shame and guilt for what you did, but really that was a, a natural expression of your body. I love that so much, Lourdes, because when you're talking about disappointing another, once again, you're in that space of disempowering and the conditioned response to it, because it's such a slippery slope, isn't it? When we're, you're constantly trying to win the approval of someone. If I think back on my own childhood, I can very much see ways that I have been shaped to try and dampen the too muchness mm -hmm. of yeah. someone else. And that can become a spiral if we're not, if we're not mindful of it. Yeah. You know, this made me think too, right? I did an interview last week with Dr. Jake Thiessen on the dark truths mm -hmm. of successful relationships. And he said something, I thought, wow, that's, that's so good. He said that in order to be in a successful relationship, you have to be willing to hurt the other person. And I was like, Damn. what? I, I'm like, talk about a dark truth. And, and he said, because, you know, he said, when you love someone and you're showing up authentically, that means that sometimes when you show up, it's going to cause the other person to be uncomfortable that perhaps your response or non-response is going to not feel good to them. But if people can begin to understand that that's a part of a healthy relationship, that I can sit here in the discomfort of knowing that what I'm saying and what I'm sharing is hurtful to you. Because a lot of times people don't say things because it will, quote, hurt. Right. You know, I don't want to hurt their feelings. I don't want them to feel bad. And that is actually a way of not showing up. He, you know, he talked about infidelity as, you know, we, people think of infidelity and they think sexual, right? But he, said, but he said, but the deepest infidelity and he goes, and usually physical in, infidelity is an, is an outgrowth of this is not showing up 
emotionally, emotional infidelity, communication infidelity, you know? And so I, I just think that that's also part that of this. Whole so family. good. Yeah. And sometimes it's even when things do feel good or you're, I'm just thinking about clients that I've had experiences with in a therapeutic environment or an energy healing, et cetera, where this may be the first space that they're allowed to truly be. And that feels good in the moment, but then here comes that vulnerability hangover, right? right? And we know from research that that's the time when clients are at their highest risk for dropping out. Like, right. like, did I go too fast? Oh my God, that was a lot of vulnerability and they're not used to it. If that was a child that's been conditioned to shut that part down and put that in their shadow, and all yeah. of a sudden, here's this therapist or this healer that's like, no, this is beautiful. Sit with that vulnerability longer. Yeah. <laughs> and that can be just as uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Waiting for the other shoe to drop, which brings me back around to what you were talking about, the untapped potentials that are in our shadow side. Yeah. So this can even be, you know, this is something I know therapists everywhere deal with are clients who are, they really don't they don't have any fluency when it comes to emotions, understanding their own or understanding others, speaking the language of emotions, because growing up, they didn't, that wasn't something that would get them love or mm -hmm. keep them safe. So emotions got put into the bag. And so that potential for them to be fully feeling, to be able to connect with their own deep emotions and to let that be their GPS, their guiding, um, their guiding their North Star, mm -hmm. or even being able to trust their intuition because, you know, this is kind of shifting gears a little bit. Oftentimes when we're younger, children are like that, the child in the, you know, the, the story of the emperor's new clothes. Yes. And in their home or wherever, children see things and sometimes they'll point them out, you know, mm -hmm. mommy, why was daddy drinking last night? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, um, how come daddy was kissing another woman? Mm -hmm. Or, or maybe walking in on um, a family member who was watching something sexual, but in their family, that's not allowed. Right. So this child is told mixed messages and then told that what they saw wasn't what they saw mm. or what they saw wasn't a big deal. Like, oh, it's okay. Daddy was just had a headache. He, he, he wasn't drinking, you know, or, and, and mm -hmm. mommy's okay. Where the child is what they're seeing and experiencing, they're told that that's not what they're seeing and experiencing. Right. And so the child learns to put that in the bag. Because mm. if they utilize that potential that they have, they are not, they lose that approval or they're told that it's wrong or, you know, so these are examples of um, untapped potentials. Or if another example could be, let's say there's a child who's very artistic, creative, and shows an aptitude for this and an interest, but he's born into a family of doctors. Right. Scientists. And so that's not really, you know, being... An artist really isn't valued in the family. You don't get a lot of attention and love for it. So he very quickly learns, okay, artistic part of me goes in the bag. And I will also follow in my father and grandfather's footsteps, and I will become a doctor too. And then this is the, the person you see, you know, when they're in their mid-30s, mid-40s. Now they are depressed, possibly um, using some, some type of behavior to cope, whether it's numbing out in some way or... You know, but, but it's showing up because they're not aligned with their true nature. So, so the shadow, shadow work also involves getting in touch with these parts of yourself that are in that bag, kind of opening the bag and saying, okay, what's in here? What did I put in here? And, yeah, so I think one of the starting points for shadow work is asking yourself, you know, what's important to me and why? Mm -hmm. And where did, that, where did that come from? What do I believe in and why? Because a lot of times people end up in a religion or a political party simply because that's what was modeled for them. Yep. <laughs> I'm raising my hand. Hello. <laughs> and then by the time, you know, and, and even if they disagree with that, now it risks losing family support and family love. So it's almost like shadow work requires you to, to risk being exiled from the tribe to some degree. It's, it's the hero's journey and it is always so worth it. I'm over here cheering because this brings me to the whole like sacred psychology piece of it. Holistic health depends upon connection to all parts of self. Yes. All parts of psyche. You will not ever truly attain a satisfying life if you are disconnected from your sexuality, creativity, the career that you wanted, the type of the political party even. Please don't make mm -hmm. me vote for Trump. <laughs> 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 like that 
it, these little things do add up. Like you say, yeah. like I am not at all surprised when a man walks into my office in an existential crisis because his family wanted him to be the doctor and he did it. And now he feels like he's wasted 20 years of his life. Yeah. Yeah. And I have had very similar experiences where someone has come in and they have built on the surface of what looks like an incredible life, an incredible career. Anyone would look at them and say, wow, mm. they, have the, they have the relationship, they have the car, the house, the business. Car. Right. And they're telling me every day I am in my car crying. Like, I, whose life is this? Like, what, hap- what happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Whose narrative am I leading? And so what I'm hearing you say is that the shadow, doing some shadow work allows us, it's one way that we can reconnect. Yes, it is. It's to reconnect and to find the parts of ourselves that were left behind, often for good reason. You know, mm-hmm. we, we put these pieces away because we needed to survive as a child. Yeah. I can't yeah. tell you how many times I was told, Tamara, shut up. <laughs> 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 and now I'm here broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. well, you yeah. know, uh, one of the things that I'll just share, it's you know, from my experience mm-hmm. just growing up in a very, very... A strict Roman Catholic home was that, you know, the body was a bad thing. Mm-hmm. It was sinful that nobody wanted to see it. Mm-hmm. Uh, nobody wanted to definitely, you know, hear about it. And so keep it covered. And um, the only time that it matters is when maybe you are trying to have children and then you better have been married in the Catholic Church. Right. <laughs> you know, so there was this whole thing of not being able to see the body mm-hmm. and then my body as beautiful, like not wanting to look at it. Yeah. Um, and then that gets in the way of, you know, your sexual relationships and things like that. So for sure. Yes. Yeah, so that's just another example of how this can, this can show up. So how does one know when they are ready to do some shadow work? Cause again, I'm trying to think about all those questions <laughs> we see on the internet. Well, I, I honestly feel that we can choose to do shadow work. Mm-hmm. But the, the most meaningful, significant shadow work usually we're dragged into kicking and screaming. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to have to unpack that. That just makes me giggle. <laughs> well, usually some, something has to happen to make us look at ourselves that closely. Mm-hmm. So a marriage has to end. You have to have a health crisis. You have to, ha- you have to experience some significant betrayal. Mm-hmm. And you kind of have to be brought to your knees. I think of the, um, you know, the, the Greek myth of Demeter and Persephone and how... Ooh. You know, Demeter and Persephone are on the, you know, in this meadow and Persephone is looking at flowers and it's just very pastoral and spring-like. Mm-hmm. And then the earth opens up and Pluto drags her down to the underworld. Right. It's kind of what a shadow experience is like. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because it takes you out of this bright, sunny, oh, this is my life. And, this, and it t- drags you down. And now you have to look at some hard truths. You right. Know? Yeah. So I think that you can intellectualize it. You can say, oh, I think I'll do some shadow work. I want to get to know my shadow. And there is value in that. You know, and there are things Doing it proactively. Mm-hmm. But typically when someone is really kind of, didn't make the choice or psyche kind of mm-hmm. summoned you in and said, hey, it's time to, to do this work. That's where the really, that's the experiential part of it. <laughs> yeah, I think that's where it's probably some of the deepest transformational stuff comes from. I'm kind of thinking, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this, the proactive style of shadow work reminds me more of internal family systems therapy. Yeah. Where I'm getting to know the different parts and the different conditioned behaviors and voices in my head, but right. it's not, it doesn't have the same visceral feel of, con- yes. I did not know that about myself. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and this is um, often... You know, when you, when you talk to people and you ask them about, you know, the most difficult things they've been through, typically they're the most transformative and typically they're different now because of that Always. situation. Mm-hmm. And so those are those, uh, you drag kicking and screaming into shadow. And then it's just like the hero's journey or, you know, where the hero goes into the underworld yeah. and he has a series of tasks that he has to do, kind of like the anonymous, mm-hmm. you know, where... For the, for, for the listeners who, not, who are not familiar, I'm not going to go into all the details, but Inanna is this queen who has to go into the underworld to get something from her sister who is in the under, rules the underworld in order to, to do something for her kingdom or something. Mm-hmm. And in order to get there, she has to pass through seven gates. Is that how many? How many? I think so. Yeah. And each gate she passes through as she goes into the underworld, she loses something. So maybe the first gate, they take her crown. The second gate, they take her clothing. The third gate. So by the time she gets to the bottom, she is just... There's nothing. She's on her knees. 
you know, mm-hmm. spent. And then her, yeah, and then her sister kills her. <laughs> okay, it's a happy so, bedtime story, <laughs> right? So there's like this, me- you know, metaphorically, there's this death, there's this loss, there's this, mm-hmm. you know, I can't go back. Something is irretrievably broken. And then what happens, of course, in, in the myth is that um, Inanna's helpers or, or the people who are, who, her, I'm not sure who they were, but she has people who come and they help her and they help put her back together. Right. And she comes back to the, to the upper world and she's a different person. She has, but now she has a gift to bring back, but she was only able to bring that gift back because of the death she experienced. She had to go down. And so shadow work is kind of like that. You're going to have to kind of be brought to your knees. And you're going to go through that whole process of, of loss and death. And you're going to come out of this and you'll bring something back that is now something that can serve others, can serve you. And that's kind of like, I guess, what another way of looking at shadow work is. Yeah, it really reminds me of the transformative goddesses across the planet, especially Kali. And Kali gets such a bad rap, very similar to shadow work, where it's like, oh, you know, you see her with this severed head and her tongue sticking out and there's fire and blood dripping and everything. But she actually represents death to illusion, death to yeah. ego, meaning not self, the non-self, yes. not pure source essence. And But it can be painful yeah. to see, oh, shit, you've been operating like this for 40 years, but that's right. not who you are. Yeah. Why are you doing that? <laughs> Stop and, that. And, and often these shadow invitations, that's such a nice way to say it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, they have to happen because if they don't happen, we won't do the shadow work. Right. And I think a woman or a man, if a man's actually listening to this, loses the, those potentials you were talking about. We lose connection to, to source energy, to self energy, if it doesn't happen. Yeah. Right. So Kali, thinking about that, like that and, and shadow work, if I don't allow that veil to be lifted, <laughs> the illusion to lift and me to see how I'm contributing to a behavioral pattern, then I miss the connection to myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. My pure self. Yeah. To your vitality, to what really enables you to live fully. Otherwise, you're just kind of like sleepwalking, you know? Ooh. I love that. I'm just picturing a whole bunch of zombies out there wondering why they're not satisfied in life. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to like run them over. Boop, you get some shadow work and boop, you get some shadow work. Yeah. Mm. So what are some practical ways, including this amazing course that you have, where people who um, want to start working on their shadow can do? Well, I think, you know, there's a lot of different ways to do this. There's, you know, <laughs> there's no one way. Right. But, um, one of the things I think would be to really, it's really simple, is do an assessment or an inventory of what you perceive are your strengths. Hmm. And then after you do that, look at what the secondary gain is behind that strength. Uh, uh, oh, God, you went there. <laughs> 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 You're hitting me in my feels, yes. And then you're getting into some shadow there because I think we can get caught up and, oh, these are my wonderful qualities and this is what I'm good at. And that's also how shadow can be really tricky because shadow is right there in front of us in our most, you know, beautiful qualities. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's the pretty veneer I give the world for sure. Yeah. That yeah. We all do. So before we move forward for the listeners who aren't familiar, what is secondary gain? Um, what are you getting out of this? How is this serving you in a way that maybe is hard for you to acknowledge or you wouldn't want anybody else to know? Yeah, so I always end up thinking about the story of Abraham Lincoln, who was traveling by carriage, and the carriage passed a bunch of squealing piglets in the mud, and they were they were drowning. Somebody had left them there, and he made the driver pull over. Here's the president of the United States, <laughs> and he made them stop and go back, and they were like, people wanted to cheer him for being, you know, a hero. Look how altruistic he is, and, and he said, uh, no, I wasn't going to be able to sleep at night. My conscience, when, if I had hadn't stopped to do that. And again, people wanted to hail it, but the story is really an archetype of even something as beautiful as altruism, of selfless giving, yeah. going back to the nurturer. He gets something out of it. He was like, I get a full night's rest and even for some of us to feel like a good person. Right. And that also, is secondary gain. And the other way to look at your positive qualities is, you know, look at one or two of your positive qualities and ask yourself, you know, when have these positive qualities helped, I mean, when have they hurt myself or hurt another? 
So, for example, you can be the mother who's very helicoptery, you mm-hmm. know, caring so much for a child, trying to protect them from consequences, you know, running their homework and lunch to school from grade kindergarten to high school. And on the surface, she looks like a really good mom. You mm-hmm. know, she's very involved. She's there all the time. And if you look at that, you know, you know, one of the ways it has hurt her perhaps is she's neglected her own life. Her life has become this child, you know. Or she's neglected her marriage or, you know, whatever. Something, something had to give. And then how have you hurt this child? Well, now this child um, has no tolerance for discomfort or uncertainty. No delayed Um, gratification. Right. And is now, um, doesn't know, didn't even fill out their own college applications. You know, mom is now rushing up to the college on the weekend because they got into a fight with their boyfriend. I have met that mother (laughs) as a college professor. Please don't be that mother. (laughs) Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, your, your mom is calling your college professor about mm-hmm. your grades. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's happened. I can't even believe it. Every time I'm like, am I being punked? Nope. It's a, <laughs> it's a loving mother. So loving. Yeah, so another way to look at it is look at how your positive qualities, your strengths, your virtues have hurt you or hurt another. And all of qualities have the potential for that. And that's what it shows. So those are some practical, easy ways right there to yes. begin to kind of tease it out. That's perfect. And I want to hear more about your course in a second. But I was also thinking, you know, my favorite, the Enneagram. (laughs) (laughs) Y'all go take, go to the Enneagram Institute.com. I really need to get an affiliate link for that sucker. Um, (laughs) I do. I'm a walking billboard. It's uh, there's something in my seven in that. And take the Take the Enneagram test there. It's $12 to do the actual psych assessment. But what I love about it is it is daily shadow work. You will see your strengths, but it will also smack a hoe with a, hey, (laughs) here's also what you're really, here's the pitfalls that you're prone to. Can you see this in yourself? And if you heal this part of yourself, you're going to be able to tap back into all of that unfulfilled potential that is truly satisfying to you, not just the conditioned behavior and responses that you are associating as you. It's not you. That's, those are the other voices that internal family systems talks about. It's not the higher self. That's how I show up. Does that make sense, Lourdes? Like, yeah, it does. Yeah. It's almost like the you without all the, with all the things that you put away in order to survive and be loved and be safe. Yeah. For me, that's the good girl image. Mm-hmm. The, the, yeah. you know, the straight A student, the pageant queen, the cheerleader, the... <laughs> All of the, you know, well, p- parts of it authentic, parts of it definitely shadow self. We well, you know, like I was just thinking about what mm-hmm. you're saying is, this is kind of what I see a lot in therapy. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of good girls and good boys, right? In therapy. Okay. Yep. I don't. I don't see the other ones in therapy. No, they're like fuck therapy. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, usually the good girl or the good boy has been carrying this image for for the world and for their families and for their children, and so they have really disconnected from parts of themselves that um, really were the, were the, where their substance is, where their vitality, where their life force is. Yes. Yeah. So it's the, when you were talking about your strengths also pointing to, you know, secondary gain, the Ennea thought that's a daily, you know, subscription for free. And once you know your Enneagram type, it'll give you just a daily, you know, thought pondering. It's a couple sentences long about your type. Mine this morning smacked me in my feels talking about how well, every <laughs> once in a while, they always smack you in your feels if it's spot on. <laughs> if you know your two type, this morning's was talking about how an unhealthy type seven, the enthusiast can actually be very manipulative in trying to make everyone around them happy. Wow. Mm -hmm. And I thought, yeah, I mean, I literally got smacked with that shadow moment, pulled down into it. (laughs) Oh, God, in grad school, that exact same thing. I just literally started laughing, reading this, prepping. I was probably on the toilet this morning, (laughs) reading this (laughs) any thought going, holy shit, I remember that moment. I was in grad school and I think I've shared this story in the podcast before. I was getting I was stuck. This is when you're learning to become a counselor and they were literally audio and video recording us. And so painful, right? (laughs) To see yourself and hear (laughs) yourself. And I was stuck with this one young client at this college center and my therapist who was gestalt, love him, to my therapist supervisor, pointed out, he said, Tamara, do you see how every time she starts to depress, you cheerlead her? Oh, wow. And I went, what are you talking about? <laughs> I did not see this in myself. <laughs> what? 
And he was like, you are cheerleading her. You won't let her sit in it. And I thought, this guy's an idiot. Why? <laughs> why? why as a counselor would we ever, she claims she's depressed. Why would I let her stay depressed in the, my therapy office? Yeah. And he said, I want you to go back in there next time and hold that inner cheerleader back and just sit with her. And so the Enneagram has been great shadow work for me because it constantly points out how the seven, it's my greatest strength to be rocket fuel for other people. I love that about myself. But in order to be a truly well-rounded person and therapist, I've had to learn to let people sit in the shit. Yeah. And to not be so uncomfortable, whether it's my child, that shows up. You're talking about children being reflectors. When my kids are whiny, oh, <laughs> that makes my seven cringe. <laughs> and to just be like, yes, that sucks is not my first go to. So, well, I think, you know, what you're touching on too, and, and I, I, I like to call those um, Enneagram messages, they're just like, they're like, Shadow shout outs are in your face. <laughs> That's right? what we call them now. Shadow shout outs. Yes, they are. Uh, Did you know this about yourself? Thank you. Bye. <laughs> it like runs away laughing. <laughs> the one email you're nervous to open every day. <laughs> yes. You're like, please be a happy one. Please tell me how awesome I am. Yeah, right. Or please don't be just, just go a little easy on me too. Yeah. Verbal KY, please. <laughs> but I think, you know, when you were talking about like this discomfort of sitting with um, someone in their sadness, you know, another way that you can work with shadow is by paying attention to the way you react to other people, because oftentimes, well, most of the time, it's more about something that's going on with you, you know, so, mm -hmm. and that's why when I was saying earlier that shadow work really just comes back to yourself, but you can use other people because you can see how, what, how you react to them, you know, so, you know, your example of, um, you know, for kids are whiny, that's really about your discomfort with anything that's not positive. Yep. Anything kind of heavy, you know? <laughs> Did, you, <laughs> Did you read yeah. the chapter on the type seven? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, you know me, Tamara, for me, mm -hmm. the type five can get just bogged down in prepar preparing and researching and never thinking they're ready, never thinking they know enough. <laughs> no. Um, yeah. <laughs> And that for fives, they can use that intellectual ability like as a, you know, as a barrier, but mm -hmm. they don't realize that to really letting others close to them or getting close to others, you know? Totally. Uh, yeah. So the Enneagram is, is a really good tool for shadow work. Yeah. And I love that it goes hand in hand with it. It always points us back to you are not your personality. Right? Yeah. Like that's not who you are. Your higher self is completely connected to all of it, whether you want to call it source energy, spirit, whatever, just the universe, or even untapped highest potential in self. Um, but you can't get there until you see these blind spots. Oh my gosh, that just reminds me too again of that, the myth of Inanna. You know, mm -hmm. every level she lost something. She mm -hmm. lost her crown. She lost her clothing. She lost her hair. And it's almost like the Enneagram strips away all that's not you. Yes. You. You're not your crown. You're not your clothes. Yeah. <laughs> who? I just got full body chills. So who are you when all of that's taken away? And that's kind of like that. Fuck. Yo, oh, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I, just on your podcast. Well, I, oh, I say fuck on my podcast all day long. That's okay. funny. You're the good girl. I think your good girl shadow is showing right now. <laughs> 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 I am marked explicit. iTunes is like, watch out for this bitch. <laughs> yes. I think all your episodes on my podcast are marked explicit <laughs> too. Yep. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you're right. I love that. You're not this. It's just, I guess it slowly takes things away from you and the veil is lifted and that can be painful like to realize yes I contributed to the failing of a marriage too or I had a like that moment in grad school of oh shit I still have it's a growth edge is the pretty word we put on it in <laughs> right. psychology here's a growth edge Tams in order to be a well-rounded counselor you need to let people wallow if they want to yeah yeah wow so talk to me about your course because I've heard raving reviews already so it's a five day, I really want to call it a mini course because I don't feel like it's justifiable to say that you can learn about shadow in five days. You can dip so your toes in. It's definitely a dip your toes. It's an introduction to what shadow is, 
how it shows up in your life, how you can begin to work with it. And so by the end of the course, you'll at least be able to recognize your shadow and have a sense of what, what's in your shadow. And at least that gives you some tools as you move forward with relationships and just life. And I think that the more we know about shadow, the more we bring what is unconscious into consciousness or what is in the darkness into light that just makes us better for ourselves and, and the world. Amen. A little self-exploration for everyone. <laughs> so where can people get their hands on that? Um, I'm, I, I'm giving you a link for, for your listeners so mm-hmm. they get a discount for the course. So for your listeners, um, it's $88. Fantastic. It's- interested. And if you go to my website, which I know you'll have in the show notes, yep. um, it's also on that homepage. There's a box that you can click on, but I would go through the link that um, you have. Tamara yeah, get the discount. <laughs> 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 Just for being fantastic sacred psychology listeners, go get your discount. So before I let you go, though, I happen to know another fantastic tidbit about you. And <laughs> <laughs> Maybe this is what happens when you go on the air with Tamara. (laughs) It's true. It's true. A little rocket fuel for every side. And I, the reason I really want to talk about it today is because it has been very helpful for my own shadow work. Hearing your fantastic master astrology side is just revolutionary when it comes to sacred psychology. Oh, thank you, Tamara. (laughs) (laughs) Yep, and I'm going to go one further because when it comes to you as opposed to anyone else, like I am a bit of a diva. I'm picky and, you know, who I work with and (laughs) who I surround myself with. I think that's smart in life. You're not just like cafe astrology. You're not just a, you know, a tarot reader. When working with that beautiful type five, Okay. When, when Lourdes Fiato reads a chart, you are getting backwards and forwards in all directions. So much information about yourself. And I will never forget being on a call with you, literally tearing up, crying, because yet another clinician, you know, had come out and just triggered something in me, you know, yeah. said, really hit that wounded spot of Tamara, you're a trapezoid. You don't fit in, in our community. And I remember talking to you about this and you just very quickly off the cuff were able to go, <laughs> well, you know where your third house is? And I'm like, no, do tell me. And so I want you to fill in how you explained that to me. Okay. So our chart is divided into 12 houses and the houses represent areas of life. And so the third house represents your community. And this is like mm-hmm. your immediate community. So your neighborhood where you live, things that are kind of close to home, metaphorically mm-hmm. and literally. And for Tamara, she has on the the cusp, which is another word for a doorway. So the doorway to her third house has Aries on the cusp. And Aries is, you know, I'm doing this really quickly. One of the things that you, you what some of the ways we look at Aries or its themes are anger, conflict, initiation, beginnings, struggle, those types of things. When you think of Aries, uh, one of the archetypes is the warrior, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, you also look at Aries. Um, it's one of the symbols for Aries is the ram. In fact, the glyph in astrology is the is it looks Those like horns. A ram. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so wherever Aries shows up in your chart, you're going to have some fights. Mm-hmm. That's where you're going to meet struggle. That's where people are going to pick fights with you. That is where you will need to grow into the higher expressions of Aries, which would be being able to fight for oneself, um, mm-hmm. being assertive, holding your ground. Um, This is where you bring that warrior energy. This is where, um, according to your blueprint for your soul, which is your natal chart is really just a lesson plan for Mm -hmm. you. Suggestions. (laughs) (laughs) You might want to try. (laughs) And um, it also lays out that in order to help you evolve into your highest expression of Tamara Powell, you know, we, the universe has arranged for you to have certain experiences. <laughs> <laughs> Such a nice invitation. <laughs> and interactions with others. And to help you develop the Aryan energy, this assertiveness, we will bring conflicts and challenges from those in your immediate community. Mm-hmm. And, and so your lesson is to, to learn how to fight those battles, to fight for yourself, because Aries is about fighting for yourself. Aries is about me. Aries, yeah. um, one of the ways you can look at it in a negative way is it can be someone who's very self-centered. Mm-hmm. On a positive way, it's someone who knows how to put themselves first, who stands up for themselves, who doesn't let others fight their battle or doesn't back down from others. 
which was so hard for that good girl mask. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, hearing you say that in just a quick phone call, and that's not even getting the full wonderful experience of Lord is that y'all need to was so healing for me. I got off that call and felt so seen and understood. And like, I had a plan. (laughs) I don't know if you knew all that, but that's how I felt in that moment. And the other part of this too for you, Tamara, is in your third house, in your natal chart, you, you have Chiron, and Chiron is known as the wounded healer. It's a place in our chart where we've experienced some kind of, of wound, and this is a wound that you're in this incarnation, it's up to you to heal. And mm. so for you, the behaviors around this would be assertiveness, defending your boundaries, just like mm-hmm. you know, we were talking earlier about the warrior and the sword. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so mm-hmm. it's for you to go out and defend your area, whatever that area is. And then in an inner level, it's this, a warrior is, has this passionate intensity. They're, they're willing to die for their mm-hmm. beliefs. Think of the warrior. And the thing with, with the warrior, it's not that they don't have fear. They, right. they go on despite the fear. So a true warrior, they're not, it's not, they're not, they're not scared, but they're, right. they're moving we're moving forward anyway. You know, you look at any of these movies, which, you know, have epic battles and warriors, you know, they're not thinking, oh my gosh, it's really scary. I don't want to do this. I could die. No, they're moving forward. <laughs> <laughs> Despite okay. that. Yes. Yeah. And so that is for you, the evolutionary goal for this house, for this expression of, of Aries is really about courage and fighting for yourself in, in a passionate way and establishing what's yours and your boundaries. Yes. And so since then, it has been for me, the shadow work has been, I call it sifting through like the rubble to find the specks of gold in it, just like a, you know, a, a gold miner back in the 1800s, you know, like this experience. Thank you, universe, that you so generously <laughs> invited me to um, multiple times over in my life. Probably, probably if I was going to write it, there'd be a whole chapter in that book on that one. Yeah. And, and finding that spot, I, it's so funny. I was literally saying this to another Jungian psychologist, you master shadow workers, you of. <laughs> it's helped me decide what am I truly passionate about? What am I willing to stake my claim on? And I can actually see an integration towards the five, the researcher in me, because I went and pulled the codes for the millionth time, you know, <laughs> and was like, yeah, I mean, have I crossed all my T's and dotted all my I's? Am I operating according to the ACA, the APA? Fuck yes, I am. And so <laughs> here comes out that shield and that sword again. I'm going, all right, you know, come yeah. for mine. That's fine. I got you. Yeah. But I had to do that. Otherwise, that good girl in me was always going to worry and fret and yeah. cater and cower. And then I, and then here comes another inner critic being like, ew, what is she doing? <laughs> <laughs> we don't even like that about us. Because it's not us. The good girl doesn't go out and fight the battles. No. You know, she can't do, she can't. Nope. Yeah. So this is a battle. This is the area in your life, which will be a battlefield. And so just expect battles here and be prepared for them and approach them with that courage and that intensity, despite the fear. What a powerful lesson. And the whole point being that even something like astrology that I still think is so misunderstood um, and is not flippant, it's not just a Chinese fortune cookie, can be an incredibly powerful way of working with your your shadow. It is powerful. And I, 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 I like to describe the natal chart as really, it's like your soul DNA. It's your blueprint. This is, you know, um, one of my teachers, um, Stephen Forrest, gave this example that, you know, if you imagine that... Um, wherever you were born. So Tamara, you were Mm -hmm. born in Wilmar, Mm -hmm. Minnesota. Yeah. Minnesota. You know, you're on this cosmic diving board above Wilmar. (laughs) (laughs) What a fun image. Yes. About to make your jump, your Mm -hmm. dive in. And, you know, the universe tells you, okay, you know, here, here's, this is your, this is your guidebook for this experience. And these are the struggles you're going to have. And this is where, this is when they'll show up and this is what they'll look like. And this is what areas of your life. And these are the things that will help you. Here are your, you know, you know, like just when you go on a journey, you have like Mm -hmm. a magic ball, you have three wishes. These are the things. And then these are the things that are going to be challenges for you. Wow. And then with all of this, in addition to all of that, this is kind of like the in a way, it's kind of a mind fuck. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> you can say that. <laughs> okay. um, you're also told, and you know what? You have freedom. So you don't have to do any of this. Mm. But if you want to reach the highest expression of your soul, if you really want to evolve into the highest consciousness for your journey, 
then here's, here's your instruction book. You know, and that's really what astrology is. That is the best fucking example, analogy, <laughs> description I have ever heard. And I'm not blowing smoke up your ass. That was amazing. <laughs> that <laughs> oh my was gosh, amazing. That's hilarious. Oh, I love that diving board with my guidebook. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then you jump and now you have a choice. You can toss that guidebook aside. Yes. Or, or maybe you can look at it sometimes and take some of it to heart. Or you can say, okay, this is what the universe said would work. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Might as well read the instructions. Oh my yes. God. Yeah. So girl, if we have not won people over by now, I'm going to be shocked, but not that that was the goal, but I wanted to tell them what has worked for me. For me, it has been Enneagram, astrology, you know, Jungian shadow dream work, et cetera. Mm-hmm. If people want to work with you as opposed to just going to cafe astrology, is there a way that they can have a session and have you read their chart? Yeah, they can just go to my website, www.lordisfiato.com. And I haven't set up an astrology page yet, but you can just do the contact me. Because <laughs> I pushed you. <laughs> or you can sign up for Right? No, I guess I have to do that. Yep. Or um, you can also do it through the depth mentorship page. So you can do that. Perfect. Well, girl, I adore you so much. Oh, thanks, Tamara. Thank you so much for sharing with us the, the depth and the breadth and the beauty of shadow work in a way that I'm sure is going to be so enlightening to everyone. Oh, thank you. Thanks for helping me to, uh, to step into this scary place. <laughs> <laughs> to jump off the diving board. Maybe I'm jump the universe's the invitation for you. <laughs> You're like pushing and dragging me down. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the Harley Quinn of cheerleaders right now. Come on, <laughs> come play. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much for having me. for listening to the Sacred Psychology Podcast. I pray you found some inspiration and empowerment to go out and make this life the most fulfilling possible. You can follow Sacred Psychology on Facebook and YouTube. If you haven't yet, please go to Apple Podcasts and subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. Tag us on social media and let us know what you think as well. Please note that the information provided is not meant to convey professional, psychological, or medical advice. If you could use such services, I highly recommend seeking them out from someone you trust. To get in touch with me personally or to see how we might work together, please check out ariatherapy.com or talesfromatrapezoid.com. Until next time, everyone.